Hey, I, I genuinely am excited about Chronicles, sorry, as I uh, arrange myself up here. Um, Chronicles, what we're attempting to do this year, as you probably know, is, is do a, a whistle-stop tour of the entire Bible to give you a really good framework of the Scriptures. So when someone says, hey, have you, why don't you read a bit of Ezekiel? You go, a what? You go, no, Ezekiel, I know where it is. And not only do I know where it is, but I know when and where it was in the context of the rest of the Bible. It's a bit like if you just moved to Bathurst and, and someone goes, I can, I'll meet you at the courthouse. And you go, the, the where? The, you know, I don't know. So you kind of, you know the landmarks of the city. You get a sense of its time and space. And it's a bit like that with the Bible the geography and the history. I know maybe school wasn't that exciting for you, perhaps, but the, the when and the where is actually really, really important to know. And so unapologetically today, we're going to be diving in a little bit of those details, okay? So strap yourself on, but we'll give you some resources afterwards so that uh, what I say today might make sense as you digest it, even if today you're going, where? <laughs> when was that? So the Chronicles that we're doing is attempting to cover a whole chunk of the Old Testament, which are the kings, right? And then you probably know there's good kings and there's not so good kings. And uh, the kings and the prophets kind of interweave. And so at the end of this month, you will have a really good view of how all the kings of the Old Testament work, when and where, and what it means for us. You think, well, so what? That was so long ago. Well, I tell you, this has so much relevance for you today, and I'm very excited to bring that to you. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these books, the Chronicles of the Kings. And I thank you that today, Lord, you would speak to us and lead us and guide us and open the word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. As a child, I was fascinated by this book on my parents' bookshelf. It's not the Bible. It's part of my family history. The Barwicks of Kent. Yeah, the descendants of James and Mary Barwick. And, and I used to, I remember, even as a little child, I used to crawl up the bookshelf and pull it off. And, and, and I'd wonder at the names. And it's an old school ancestry book, right? Sort of like, like that. You know, it's, it shows who sort of the family tree and how many kids someone had and who they married and, and all that sort of stuff. And it was just fascinating to me. And I'd look at all these names, Lorraine, Joyce, Bell, and Percival Godhue got married and had Gary, Leslie, and Adam. David, Keith, Barwick, and Anne Rosalie Trotter got married and had Samantha Joy Barwick. And I'd read these names, and then, then I'd find this page, 131, the best page, and Arthur Harold Wood and Eva Elizabeth Richmond, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, mum's parents, and there, number one, daughter, Yvonne Carol Wood, married John Arthur Lloyd in 1968. And then listed here are three boys, David John Lloyd, Jeffrey Robert Lloyd, Stephen Ross Lloyd. There's me. I'm in here. I'm written in the book of life. <laughs> I used to love finding my name there. I used to love sort of trying to work it. Okay, well, Arthur and Eva, then, wow, I went. And, and, you know, it sort of goes back to page 60, and I work out their parents. And, you know, you've probably got books like this hanging around your family tree. And it's only just one, obviously, one part of my family tree. The other parts are not so well-known or glorious. You know, some, a runaway slave, I think, wasn't it, Ben? <laughs> Is uh, my, my father's family history, where the Lloyd comes from. And uh, you would have interesting family members, I'm sure. And there'd be some skeletons in your closet, and there's probably some kings and queens in your closet. You know, there's, there's all types of people in your family tree, and I find it, it fascinating. 
But what about yours? Do you know something of your family tree? How far back can you go? I can go back to 1853, I think. No, no, 1812, James Barwick. And I'm sure we could trace it back further than that. But did you know that no matter, no matter what your family tree, your family history, there is a profound verse in the Bible that is way more amazing than even just finding your name in some kind of book on a shelf. Here, here is this scripture, Galatians 3.28. It says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, according to promise. Did you catch that? If you are Christ, if you are in Christ, if you are of Jesus' people, you are Abraham's offspring. In other words, the Abraham that we looked at in Genesis 12 is your family tree. Got it? You are part of the family of God that goes way back 2,000 years ago. Way, way back. And it gives you a place and it gives you a heritage. Now, I don't know if where your family is, but, but I do know that with Abraham and with all the descendants that we're about to look at, they're actually our offspring. Together, we are the family of God. We're not disconnected. We, we are all one in Christ Jesus, but we also have a common ancestor. We really, really do. We've been brought into this amazing family. And we'll see some not so amazing relatives, ancestors. We'll see some pretty interesting stories in the Bible. The Bible, I love it, is brutally honest. Have you noticed that? It kind of proves to me that the Bible's true. I mean, if I was to write the Bible, I wouldn't write some of the stories that are in here. Oh, goodness. We'd just brush over that little story, wouldn't we? Oh, David and Bathsheba. Oh, goodness. Tamar. Oh, my goodness. I mean, there's so many stories in here that I would... If I was God, I'd I just... But God is okay at our weakness, Zach. God is okay with human failing and actually writes us in. But I'm getting way ahead of myself. Way ahead of yourself. So we're looking at some ancestry today. It's the when, the where, and the who. I want to start going into 1 Chronicles 1.10. Let's go back to the beginning. Let me read you this from 1 Chronicles 1.10. It's exciting reading. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalil, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Shem. You with me? <laughs> Ham, Japheth. The sons of Japheth, Goma, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshesh, and Tiras. Good name suggestions if you're looking for names of your kids. The sons of Goma, Ashkenaz, Riphath, Togoma, the sons of Javan, Eliasher, Tashish, Kittim, Rodanim, the sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan, the sons of Cush, Seba, Hevila, Sabta, Rama, Sabteka, the sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dedan, Cush fathered Nimrod, who was the first on earth to be a mighty man. Would you love to be Nimrod? I'm the first mighty man. And so you might read that and you go, what? Like, that's dull, that's boring. But actually, when you start to look down into these people, my goodness, there's some powerful, powerful people. I mean, Adam. Pretty powerful. Good name, Adam. Uh, and you start to see the, sh the, the lines that break down. In verse 4, we get Noah and then Shem. So Shem's three kids. And then Shem, and it breaks down uh, in 1 Chronicles 1.24. Let's go to the next little bit. We see Shem, Ashipat, Shelah, Eba, Peleg, Ru, Serag, Nahor, Terah, Abram. That is Abraham. And now we're starting to get into some history. Now we're starting to get into some, some things that we know about. 
So I wonder, I wonder how you know. Let, let's flick to a big timeline here that I showed at the start of this whole series back in February. Okay, you might remember this. We have, just to locate some things, we've got eternity past, we've got the beginning back then, okay? And then we've got eternity future. So when Jesus comes back, we ushers us into eternity, into the, the, the eternal future that we have. And now we're about here, you can see that, a bit after 2000. But bang in the middle here is Jesus, zero We've got him sitting inside the Roman era. Then we get the Middle Ages and the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, the Information Revolution. But going back, the red is the Jewish nation. And we have, at 2000, we have Abraham. Ballpark figures, but it's really good for you to know. 2000, Abram. 1500, Moses. 1000, David. You with me? 500 exile to Babylon. Now, we're going we're gonna to work on this, this uh, half of the year, right? The Old Testament. But we're going to locate Abram right there, 2,000 years. So that's the big picture. That's where the Old Testament sits. The New Testament just sits in this green bit here. See that? It's, it's this short little bit there. But the Old Testament pretty much takes, obviously, eternity past, you know, in the beginning. But really, we start the story in Genesis 12 at about 2000 uh, BC before Christ. Let's jump and zoom in on the Old Testament. The next little slide here shows us a bit of a, a zoom in picture. There we go. This is good. Now, this is what I'm going to put in the, the newsletter on Monday. So if you're not sure how this works. So what I've done here is I've, I've zoomed out a bit. 2000. 1,500, 1,500, okay, so I've shifted Jesus, <laughs> he's, he's now up there, we're really just focusing in, and, and it's my conviction, if you can get an understanding of the timeline of the Old Testament, if someone asks you where something is, you kind of know where it is, so this is going to be a bit of a test in about a month, we're going to have a multiple choice quiz, so here it is. Abram, patriarchs, Moses rescues them. We have then Saul, David, and Solomon, and we have all the kings of Israel. This is where we're zoning in here. Kings of Israel, kings of Judah, the nation divides. We're going to look at that, an exile and a return, and then Jesus comes back. I keep coming back to that picture. But that is, if you could get that, if you could understand that, it's really, really going to help you read the Old Testament. So we're going to just weave in some Bible, weave in that picture, and weave in, there's a map up here. You with me? Okay, here's the map. If you could journey the Old Testament, if you could draw it out, this is what it would look like. Abram starts at Ur, goes up here to Tehran, gets the call of God in Genesis 11, go to a land. He travels to the land here. He pops in and out of Egypt a couple of times. Eventually, there's a big drought that we looked at last month. They go down to Egypt under, under Joseph. They're in Egypt for 400 years. Moses comes along rescues them, you know the story, the Exodus, Red Sea, that's down here, takes them through the wilderness in, the, in Mount Sinai, 40 years. Moses takes them up into the back of the wilderness, back here, Deuteronomy, gives the whole of Deuteronomy, here's the message, here's how you do it in the promised land, hand it over to Joshua. Joshua says, great, I'll take it from here. They go, they cross into the land of Canaan, miraculous again, and then Joshua and the people conquer the land, and that's basically it. They, they stay there until two things happen. The kingdom splits. You've got a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom gets carted away in 722 BC. The northern kingdom, the Samaritans up here, carted by the Assyrians to Nineveh. They never come back. Gone. 
southern kingdom, that's Benjamin and Judah down here. 586 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar comes and takes waves over to Babylon and destroys the temple. 586 BC. 70 years later, they sit, this is Daniel, they come back here under Ezra and Nehemiah, retake land, rebuild the temple, and then that's pretty much it for the Old Testament. There's 400 years of silence. Like, there's no prophets, no one speaks, but lots happens. The, the Greeks come in and the Romans come in, a few other people come in. By the time Jesus comes in, this, this people, they're a bit beleaguered, actually. Now, you may not yet understand that, but, oh, good teacher that I am, I have some homework for you. I want you to grab one of these at the end. I'll stick them at the back. And, uh, and that is that map with that timeline on the back. And as you read through it, stick that in your Bible, and that'll really help you just locate parts of the Old Testament. I tell you, otherwise the Old Testament is a fog. Where, where, where did the Psalms fit in? Where, where, Isaiah, like how does that relate to Abraham? You know, but it, it actually is one beautiful, glorious story. Okay, there's the, there's the scene. Let's dive in. Come with me to 1 Chronicles 2. Let's look at these people. 1 Chronicles 2, 1. These are the sons of Israel. Who's Israel? <laughs> it's tricky, isn't it? Israel is Jacob. He gets renamed. Abram gives birth to Isaac. Isaac gives birth to twins, Jacob and Esau. Jacob has an encounter with God. He's, a, he's an interesting character. He has an encounter with God. God changed his name to Israel, the father of nations. Right? And these are the sons of Israel. Twelve sons become twelve tribes. Here they are. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Dan, Joseph, we looked at last week, Benjamin, good name, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Twelve sons, twelve tribes of Israel. And now we focus in on Judah. Judah, firstborn son, also, sorry, not, not firstborn, fourthborn son, but becomes something significant, which prophesied about him in Genesis 49. Sons of Judah are Ur, Onan, and Shelah. These are the three Bathsheba, the Canaanite, bore to him. Now Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death. His daughter-in-law, Tamar, also bore him Perez and Zerah. Fascinating story, Genesis 39. His daughter-in-law, Judah, had five sons in all, the sons of Perez, Hezron, and Hamel. Verse 6, the sons of Zerah. So what it's doing is it's grabbing one particular line and focusing on that particular line. Just like there's no way like the entire descendants of James and Mary Barwick would, would fill this book. I mean, it would be massive, wouldn't it? So, so it just channels one particular line all the way down. Verse 7, the sons of Kami, Achan, the troubler of Israel, who broke faith in all the matter of the devoted thing, and Ethan's son was Azariah. The sons of Hezron that were born to him, Jeremiel, Ram, Chelebi. Ram fathered Amimadad, Amimadad. And Amimadad fathered Nashon, the prince of the sons of Judah. Now I want you to look at number 11. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. You know who Jesse is. <laughs> this is getting fun. Jesse, verse 13, fathered Eliab, his firstborn, Abinadab the second, Shemir the third, Nathanael the fourth, Radai the fifth, Ozem the sixth, David the seventh. And their sisters, ladies, was Roya and Abigail. Sons of Zeruiah, Abishai, Joab, Ashael, three, 
Abigail Ball Amasa, and the father of Amasa was Jeho the Ishmaelite. You might be thinking, why am I reading out all these names? Like, so what? I can't even pronounce them, let alone understand who they are. But these names are listed in the Word of God for all eternity. These names show the pattern and the path of the kings of Israel. Let's go back to verse 10. Sorry, uh, let's look at verse 13. Seven sons of Jesse just casually mentions. Oh, and by the way, David's the seventh son. What, David? David becomes the greatest king ever to have lived. Just casually mentioned in it. We know about David. We don't know about a lot of the rest of them. And then it goes on, you know, 1 Chronicles 3. I'm not going to dive in too hard. These are the sons of David who were born to him in Hebron, the firstborn, Ammon, and et cetera. It goes on and on and on. But what I want you to see this morning is just four things as to why this all matters. And if you've read and if you're part of doing this plan with us, you'll be scratching your head by now. You'll be up to 1 Chronicles 6 and 7 today. And you go, what is this all about? I'm going to give you four, four things that are going to help you in realizing that this is actually really, really key. First reason it really matters is to know your Old Testament and to understand the time and the place. This, this chapter, these chapters give us a, a view of who was who and when they were. It gives us a sense of who was father to who. And it mentions the tribes and the fathers and the parents. That's really important for you to know. And that's why these maps become all the more important. And if you can walk through that map and understand how these people fit in, it's going to give you greater confidence. You can pick up the book and you know, I, I get it. I know where that is now. So the first thing, the first reason why it matters is it gives us a clue as to where things happen and when they happened. And that gives you confidence to read the Old Testament. There are many Christians who don't give the Old Testament too much of a look, to be honest. They might have a bit of a flick through, through Psalms, have a look at Genesis yeah, in the beginning and Psalms are cool, they're, you know, good when I'm in trouble. And uh, uh, Proverbs are good because, you know, very practical. Uh, but the rest of it? I mean, who's read Leviticus lately? I mean, who's read the minor prophets lately? Zechariah. Who's read Zechariah lately? Who's read Ezekiel all the way through? These are fabulous, fabulous books. Just know that this is all the Word of God, Old Testament, New Testament. Now, it's going to take some interpretation. And you can't apply everything in the Old Testament directly, just like you can't apply everything in Revelation directly. You have to have the smarts and have just a little bit of background. But with a little bit of background, you'll find some absolute gold and you'll find that God starts speaking to you through the Old Testament. So what I want to give you this, this half of the year is the confidence to actually open the Old Testament because it is the Word of God. And you will be blessed when you're engaged with the Word of God personally, I tell you. So the first thing is that it will give you confidence to understand the structure of the Old Testament. That's a good thing. Second thing, second reason why I might want to read that is that we share a common ancestry. As I mentioned before, this amazing verse from Galatians 3.29, that if you are Christ, then you are Abram's offspring, heirs according to promise. I want to underscore how significant that is. Our world is a world of dislocation and confusion. And many people are scrabbling for their identity somewhere. If they don't know much about their racial background, they, they might find their identity in something else. We live in a world where people are shifting all over the place and are not really sure of their ancestry. But I tell you, you can be sure of your ancestry. It's written in the book. Just like my name is written in this book, 
your name may as well be in here because Abram is in here and you are a descendant of Abraham. Therefore, you have an identity. You have a purpose beyond the immediate. You have ancestry that you can really identify. You can really go, these are my parents. These are my ancestors. They're a while ago, but not that long ago. We're only talking 4,000 years ago. We're not talking sort of, you know, huge amounts of time, really. These people are significant people. So when you read these names, you go, these are my people. These are my ancestors. It gives you an identity. It gives you a place to belong. And it connects us together. We have a common ancestor. Just like I might go to a family reunion. <laughs> you ever been to that one of those? And you meet cousins-in-law that you've never even thought about and you all smile. I tell you, every Sunday is a family reunion here. We're actually family. We're actually brought into the family of God. We're adopted in. That's a significant thing. There are many people in this world who are disconnected even from their own families. But I tell you, you have a family have a family in Christ, and therefore you have an adopted family that, that goes way back to Abram. That gives us history. It gives us a purpose. It gives us a belonging together that's very significant. Number three, you belong. You belong. Along with some other pretty crazy characters. Now you might be thinking, I'm not sure if I'm that great. I'm not sure that I deserve to be in the family tree of God. You ever, ever felt that? Look at these amazing, look at King David. Of course he's in the family tree of Jesus. What, what an amazing king. But, but me? Like, who, who am I to be part of the family of God, really? And I find that many people recoil from it. They go, oh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm not that. I'm just, you know, I'm, I can't put words to it. I don't deserve to be written in this book, but I tell you, you belong. Let me give you an example. In the start of Matthew's gospel is a genealogy. Again, many of you might have skipped this over. But it's at the start of the gospel, and it gives us something amazing. Let's, let's go there right now. The book, Matthew 1. We're reading lots of names. We may as well go there. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Here it is. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus lists Abraham as his ancestor. Abraham, here it is. Verse 2, was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, the 12 tribes of Israel. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. If you know that story, it's a horrific story. You would not want to be Judah in that story. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Amin. I said that wrong the first time. Amin, Ab Amin Adab. Amin Adab. And Amin Adab. The father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab. Rahab? Rahab? Do you know what Rahab was? Do you know what her occupation was? She was a prostitute in another country. She hid the spies. Do you know the story of the spies in the Canaan? But there's a prostitute in Jesus' genealogy. It's like Judah's. Daughter in law, uh, Therese. Oh, goodness. That's scandalous. Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. Ruth? Well, a, there's women in this, obviously. But actually, in this day and age, um, usually women weren't written in genealogies. Ruth was a foreigner. She wasn't part. How, how can she be in? She's a Moabitess. Yeah, let's keep going. This is scandalous. Obed, the father of Jesse. That's okay. Jesse, the father of David, the king. David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Right, right, right. Hang on. 
wife of Uriah, that was Bathsheba. That was the woman that David looked across and said, come over here, love. Slept with her, had a son or two or three, killed her husband in battle and then took her for a wife. I mean, there's some scandalous stories here, aren't there? I mean, I, I don't, there's nothing like that in mine. <laughs> it's all in a nice book. We have no idea, do we, what's behind the closet. But I tell you, Jesus lays it all out there. He says, this is my family, people. These are my ancestors. And get this, the Holy Spirit, the pure one, God, comes and partners with this rabble, partners, Mary, pure Mary, is partnering with all these people in the closet. What's your excuse for not being included in God's family? You belong. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter some things that you're ashamed of. It does not make any difference. Because in Christ, we are brought near. In Christ, we are included in His family. In Christ, we belong. How exciting is that? You don't belong based on your heritage or your ancestry or how good you were or your vocation or your profession. You belong because of who you are. And that's a powerful statement. Our world does not live there. We belong because we're of some tribe or some background or some agenda or a profession or a class or a status. But actually God is saying, no, you belong because of who you are. And it does not matter where you're from, what your background is. I find this hugely exciting. Therefore, when I read these people and I understand the, the trauma and the drama that's in here, God is saying, it's okay. It's not okay to live like that, but it's okay that these people have wrestled with imperfection. These people have wrestled with hardship and trial. Number four, God is sovereign over history. Number four reason why you should read Chronicles. God is sovereign. It's God who has mapped these people out. It's God who's sovereign. I mean, this drives me crazy. I'm thinking, if, if these couple hadn't met on a boat out of Kent, where would I be? Does that do your head in? When you go back, you think, you know, four or five generations, maybe what, 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 if, what if they didn't meet? What if there was another guy or another girl? But, but, but God is sovereign, and, and somehow God has created you before the creation of the world. He thought of you. He made you up before the creation of the world, Ephesians 1. God, God knows all this. Even if you're not proud of how you got here or that there's some scandal as to some baby in, like in my family... If it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here. God is sovereign. Even when it looks bad, even when there's some things that maybe we think that is terrible, God is still sovereign, still in control, and still bringing His purposes to pass. His purposes will continue even in human imperfection. That's got to be good news. And so when you engage in the, we're going to look at the kings of Israel. Oh, my goodness. God is still sovereign. God is still making a way. God is still bringing Christ through it all. So, read it. Delight in it. Chase up the stories. Google it. You know, tell me who Tamar was. Tell me. I want to find out. Get interested. Grab the map. Grab the timeline. Let's go. This is your ancestry. This is more significant. Let's get the musos on stage for a moment as we wrap up.
there are some people here this morning, and you might even be doubting your worth, your value, your heritage. This should be speaking to you saying that I can be someone of significance because Christ is in my ancestry, because Abram is in my interest. Would you stand up with me for a moment? I want to pray over you as, as we finish. And I'm hoping that there's going to be some, a sense of joy and life and freedom over the plans that God has for you, even into the future. Let's pray for a moment, hey? Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for these people. I thank you for my ancestors. I thank you for our ancestors. I thank you that you have brought us together as your family, the church. I thank you that we have a heritage together that is far beyond any division, anything. I thank you that our heritage, Lord, is cemented and secure and solid. And I thank you, Father, for the, the journey of the Old Testament history, the geography, the people. And I thank you that as we explore that this month, that, that you'll really bring us to life and understanding of how amazing this is. If you're here this morning and you, and you doubt your worth because of where you've come from or where you stand, I want you to know this morning that your significance is huge, is in Christ. Just like Rahab, perhaps just like Ruth, like Tamar. Maybe you don't feel like you belong in the house of God, but I tell you, you've been brought in. It's a gift. It's a gift. And this morning, God is saying to you, you belong. You belong. You have a place in God's family. You have a home. This is your home. These are your people. You can find great joy in that this morning. Lord Jesus. Sit with that for a moment. God has brought you near. God has brought you in. And this morning, if you feel like you don't connect, we've never really connected with Jesus, but this morning you, you need to, you want to. There's a sense that I, I want to become part of this family. You think, I know it's crazy. I don't know the people are crazy. But there's something about these people, God. There's something about the destiny of these people that, that is compelling. And, and you want to join Jesus in His family forever. Is there anyone here, you feel like you're outside of the family, but God has brought you near and you just need to declare that this morning. Just, just raise your hand. I am going to pray for you. Is that you this morning? want to know the author of life and be connected to his crazy family. I'd love to pray with you. Thank you, Jesus. We pray for you. For God, I'm praying for each person here. Blessing, life, favor, joy, 